All right, we're going to finish up some of these notes. I actually am going to have you go back to one that we skipped. And I want to hit the trig just again to revisit that unit circle that some of you are still struggling with a little bit. So remember, basically, loosely, if our function has no issues when we plug the limiting value in, issues basically occur when the denominator equals zero. And again, that's loosely. We'll ref get that a little bit more concrete later. But what we do is we just directly plug 5 pi thirds in for alpha. So we'd say tangent 5 pi over thirds over 5 pi thirds, 5. I said over thirds, five, tangent 5 pi thirds over 5 pi thirds squared. So what I need to do is go figure out what's the tangent of 5 pi over 3. I need to be 100% sure, so I'm making myself a little cheater over here. I know that 5 pi over 3 is 10 pi sixths. This is 3 pi over 2 right? or 9 pi sixths. So I'm at this guy right here. Reference in the first quadrant is over here. We memorize that this first one over here has a one half in the sine slot or the y slot. This one reverses. So I'm just I use that first quadrant to help me out. And now on this one, I am still to the right one half, but I'm down root three over two. So when I do tangent of 5 pi thirds, I would do sine negative root 3 over 2 over cosine, which is a half. When I multiply by the reciprocal, the 2's will cancel. It's going to leave a negative square root 3 on the top. And then on the bottom, I'd have 25 pi squared over 9. We can't leave complex fractions, so you'd multiply by the reciprocal of the term under the primary fraction bar. So you can go ahead and wrap that one up. But I'd multiply by 9 over 25 pi squared. So uh, moving right along over here, let's go take a look at it. I left off at letter F in most classes. We're going to skip G. Hopefully you remember how to factor a difference of cubes. But remember, one of the factors is down here. But we're going to head on to letter H, and we'll start this one, but we won't finish. So the first thing we always do as we approach negative 2 is we plug it in. Whether it's from the left or from the right, you're going to go plug that negative 2 in, and you're going to see what you're go you get. I'll get a negative 4 plus 5, which is 1. Its primary square root is 1. Minus 1 is 0. I actually like to write like that instead of equals 0. I like to do that arrow. It's heading towards 0. Um, on the bottom, same thing. I've got that indeterminate form of 0 over 0. Remember what that means. It means that graphically there will be a hole in the graph, which we also call a removable discontinuity. It also means algebraically that because a 0 occurred on the top and the bottom, the top really somehow has a square uh, x plus 2 in it as well. You can't see it, but when we rationalize it by multiplying by 2x plus 5, the conjugate of the um, part of the fraction that has the root in it, in this case it's the numerator, but sometimes that root will be in the denominator, but you do the conjugate and I might not take this one all the way out because I did an example similar in class. But remember, you FOIL where the root originally was, which is on top. Conjugates only require you to do firsts and last. You don't FOIL the other level. I don't drop my limit, or I have notation errors, which cause you not to earn some points. Remember, it doesn't cause you to lose them. There are points to be earned. And if one of them's for notational fluency, you won't earn it if you drop that limit right now. So when I multiply root x plus 5 times root x plus 5, I, or 2x plus 5, I just get 2x plus 5. On the last, I get minus 1. On the bottom, I'm not going to FOIL it. Not that it's wrong. It's just going to be more difficult to work with. So that's what I'm sitting with. On the top, I really have a 2x plus 4. Remember what I told you. Because negative 2 was causing a 0, I know there's an x plus 2 somehow in that numerator. I've now found it. 
And again, I'm not dropping my limit yet because I'm just doing simplification. I'm modifying the function. I'm simplifying the function. I'm factoring the function. I'm not plugging values in yet. That's when you get to drop your limit. Sorry, better factor that correctly, huh? And then on the bottom, I have the x plus 2 times square root 2x plus 5 plus 1. Now these cancel. Graphically in your mind, again, we can't see the graph, but I know as I approach um, negative 2 from both directions, I will arrive at a hole in the graph. The limit is the y value there. So I now have to re-plug the negative 2 in, and now that I plug in, I can drop my limit notation. I'd have a 2 on the top, and on the bottom, when I plug in a negative 2, I'll have the square root of 1 plus 1, which is just 2. My limiting value is 1. What does that mean on the graph? It means the location of the hole in the graph is when x equals negative 2, I will arrive at 1. It is the limit. In another section, it's going to ask you, um, what should f of negative 2 be assigned to remove the discontinuity? Well, you just say, I want to make f of negative 2 equal to 1, so that hole gets filled in. So the language is going to change, but the math will not. I won't do letter i, because it's another conjugate one. All right, let's do letter j. We're going to go plug um, that 0 in, and when I do, I get a half plus 1 over 0 over 0. Now, that's a pretty big mess, but what I'm noticing is this complex fraction. And before I do anything, I'm going to clean it up. I'm going to do my Chris plus cross all over multiply across all over x. And again, remember, you always start in that top left. So I would do x plus x plus 2 all over x times x plus 2 all over x. When I clean that up, I'll have the limit as x is approaching 0 of 2x plus 2 all over x squared times x plus 2. Now, when I put the 0 in, let's see if that cleans it up. When I put the 0 in now, and again, nothing's really canceling. The top could be 2 times x plus 1. Nothing's canceling. What that's telling me is I don't have a hole in the graph there. I um, do, though, have an asymptote there because we can't divide by 0. So my task is to figure out at that asymptote, I'm not getting 0 over 0, though. If I were to plug this in, I would get a 2 over 0. This implies asymptotic behavior, not a hole in the graph. So remember, for asymptotic behavior, I need to creep in from the left of 0 and creep in from the right of 0. And I taught you how to do that in class. But you would do a sign analysis, letting x approach 0 from the left, so letting x equal maybe a negative 0.01 or 001, and from the right, let x equal positive 0.01. And you know how to do that from there. So I'm just going to leave that one. Um, I'm trying to think of what I want to do. I think we'll go do letter K next. And again, it doesn't matter whether I'm doing a left, a right, or a both two-sided approach. I still plug this constant in. I love it when I get a numerical answer, like 4 or 5 or 0, because that's my limit. When I don't, I have to figure out what's happening graphically so my algebra can follow. So this would be 3 times 2 squared, which is 12. I'm just going to write it off on the side here. I like to. Uh, then it'll be plus 7 times 2, plus 2, something non zero over 0. I don't even really care what's on the top. I now know that I have an asymptote on the bottom. And if I factor x minus 2 and then x plus 2, I can certainly see that it's this factor that's kind of the algebraic cause of the asymptote. So my task is now, I'm a one-sided approach. So remember, when you hit an asymptote, in this case it's going to be 2, I'm only coming in from the right. My choices are one of two. I'm either heading to infinity or I'm heading to negative infinity. To decide which, you do a little sign analysis, but it's always helpful helpful, especially when you're dealing with decimals, to have everything factored. 
before you do your sign analysis. So if I were you, I would go get that all factored out um, on the bottom as well. These are going to now um, cancel those two. That's really not my issue for this problem, but it tells me that if I had been approaching negative two, there would have been a hole in the graph, but I'm not. I'm approaching two, so I'm heading up on this asymptote. I really just need to take this remaining piece and do a sign analysis. So I'm going to have x equal something right to the right of two. And I'm going to plug it into the top for x and notice that it's positive. I'm going to plug it into the bottom for x and notice that it's also positive, which indicates that my function will be going to positive infinity, which by nature doesn't exist. So keep that in mind. But I'd like to show you, like, let's just say if I were to plug this 2.001 in, I'd get something really close to 7, a little more than 7 on the top. So I'm going to put 7 with a little more. I'm going to just put a little plus on there. On the bottom, if I did 2.001 minus 2, I'd get 1 1,000th. If I write that here, I have a little more than 7 and 1 1,000th. We multiply by a reciprocal, which is going to send that all the way up to 7,000. So you can see it numerically heading to infinity as well. But we don't really care about where or how fast it's going to infinity. We really only need to do the signs to determine whether it's going to positive or to negative infinity. So the next one we're going to do is down here. This is sort of what I had you practice. The only difference is on your test, we didn't have this limit in front of here. So the first thing we're going to do, if I just plug 0 in for h, by the way, I'd have f of x minus f of x, which is 0 over 0. This has issues. Where's the issue? At h equals 0. So basically, the factor that I'm going to try to cancel out is just the variable h or h minus 0. But in order to do that, I have to do f of x plus h. That means x plus h goes in for all the x's. Then I have to subtract f of x, do it in parentheses. And if you'll remember, I assigned this on delta math. And then we also did a quiz correction on it. And then technically, this is all over h. And I'm now taking a limit. So let's get all our notation down. I would need to FOIL this and distribute this negative and distribute this negative in. So I'm going to do that all in one lump sum, if you don't mind. When I FOIL x plus h, I get, you could write it out if you want to, but it's just x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. That is this part. There's a 2 in front of it, so this would become a 2. This will become a 4, and this will become a 2. Next up, I'd have a minus 3x, minus 3h, and then I have the plus 4. And then I have to also distribute this in, and it would be a minus 2x squared. Well, that's just going to take this guy off. It would be a plus 3x. That's just going to take this guy off. And that will be a minus 4, which is just going to take that off. Notice everything that did not, sorry, I forgot my H on here. Everything that did not have an H in it canceled off. The reason I knew that's going to happen is my issue is at H, so I know it needs to factor out so I can cancel it. Right here I have a linkage error. I am taking a limit, and so I can't legally write that without holding on to that limit. Again, you can't get rid of it until you plug 0 in for h, which if I do right now, I'm going to get 0 over 0 again. So I shall factor it out, and I'll get 4x plus 2h minus 3 all over h. I purposely, again, did something incorrect. If we were in class, I'd say, what did I do? And again, I dropped that limit, which again is called linkage. And even if I don't have the equals there, and you're like, I'll avoid that by not putting equals, it's still notational fluency that you, you're not showing. So um, let's go, where am I? I'm crossing the H's off. And then I shall now re-plug in a 0 for the H. And when I do that, I'd get a 4x plus 2 times 0 minus 3. This answer is 4x minus 3. And you might say, well, what's the limit? It depends on what x is. If 
x is 2, the limit would be 5. Next step. So now we need to deal with how do we deal with absolute value? A uh, little tricky because usually if I ask this in class and I tell kids what's the absolute value of x, they'll say it's positive. I'll say, yeah, true, but why? Or they'll say it's the distance from zero. Yes, that's how we use it in elementary school. If I ask what's its graph look like, I usually get the answer. It makes a V. But again, why? I really, It's really important that you understand how it's defined. Absolute value is actually a piecewise function. It is not a V. It's two lines that happen to meet at a vertex. The absolute value of x will be x. Absolute value of 7 is 7. Absolute value of 9 is 9, as long as x is greater than or equal to 0. However, if x is less than 0, the absolute value of negative 3 isn't negative 3. It's the opposite of negative 3. So we say it's negative x. It's really absolute value, if that's my function, if my function is y equals the absolute value of x, really what happens is to the right of 0, it's the line y equals x, not this dotted stuff. To the left of 0, it's y equals negative x, which is why it makes that v. It pieces two lines together at the vertex. So think about that. Here's the sketch. So if I were to write absolute value of 2x minus 5 as a piecewise function, what that means is I would say that 2x minus 5 is going to be equal to, in absolute value, maybe even if I want to write y equals or f of x equals, it will be itself to the right of the vertex. So it will be 2x minus 5, but not x greater than or equal to 0. Actually, if x is 0, I'd be taking the absolute value of negative 5. So I'd have to be careful here. So it's to the right of the vertex, which is at 5 halves. So it'll be this exact graph, right? It just has a new vertex, and it'll be going up steeper. But it, it's very similar. So um, I would be to the right of 5 halves. It's actually the opposite of that to the left of 5 halves. So you locate that vertex, and you think of it as being a piecewise function. It works with numbers. Watch. I'm going to pick an x greater than or equal to 5 halves, maybe 4. The absolute value of 8 minus 5 is 3. I might as well have not even had the absolute value bars on it. It's just 2 times 4 minus 5. I don't need them. So that's why it's just 2x minus 5. But if I head to the left, of 5 halves. Let's say at 1. The absolute value of 2 times 1 minus 5 actually needs the absolute value bars on it because it's actually the opposite. It's actually 3. You'll notice that it's actually the opposite of 2x minus 5, or the opposite of negative 3. So the moral of the story is that it shifts to the opposite on the other side of the vertex. So watch. If I plug in a 0 here to this next limit, I get 0 over 0. It's a problem. It's a big problem, actually. You might say, well, I'm just going to cancel the x's and get 1. But remember, the absolute value of x is either plus or minus x, depending. So really, I'm going to be looking at it has a piecewise function. If I wanted to write it out, you're eventually just going to memorize it. But as long as x is greater than 0, it can't be 0. That causes an issue. But as long as it's greater than 0, it's just x over x. The absolute value of x is x, as long as x is bigger than 0. But it's negative x when x is less than 0. You might say, LaRude, what about at 0? We can't have x be 0 for this one. Really what that means is it's 1 or negative 1. So the graph of this will look like this. 1 to the right, y is negative 1 to the left, and at 0 I have this undefined place right here. So when I ask, what's the limit as I approach from both directions? It truly does not exist. Agreed? But what's my limit as I approach 0 from the right? Then it's 1. As I approach 0 from the left, then it's negative 1. So absolute value can be tricky, but creeping actually can help as well. So I'll just maybe do two of these down here. 
Um, first of all, when I do something over itself, by the way, just knowing that the absolute value of some stuff over the same stuff is always going to equal either 1 or negative 1. It has to, right? So if you're not sure which, you could always be a creeper. So when I'm coming in from the left, agreed, of 5, I'm coming in from the left. In my head, I'm thinking 4.99. I already know this is either 1 or negative 1. So let's think of 4.99. 4.99. On the top, I would have the absolute value of, maybe I won't go that close to 5 so you can see it a little better. Let's go a little farther to the left so you can see it. On the top, I'd have the absolute value of negative 3, which is 3, over negative 3, which is negative 1. So I know I'm on the side where it's at negative 1. So I'd say negative 1. If I came in 5 from the right, let's maybe try a 7. Then the absolute value of x minus 5 is just x minus 5. The absolute value of 7 minus 5 is 7 minus 5. It's just 2. And on the bottom, I get another 2. So if that had said 5 from the right, I'd get a 1. Its graph always looks like this. The only difference is that will be shifted 5 to the right. So the absolute value of 2x minus 5's graph goes like this, up at 1, down at negative 1. So if I didn't have any directional approach on that, it would be a true d &E. I think the last one we'll do of these, I might touch on one of these in class as well. But I'm going to go do the hardest one. I'm going to star this. I told you why I star them. I'm going to have you rewrite the starred ones at some point. But let's go take a look at what happens here. First thing I do is I plug that 3 in. I can immediately see an issue on the bottom. I'm going to have a 0 on the bottom. And I see that polynomial on the top. It's telling me I better factor. And again, when I'm doing my manipulation, I don't drop that limit. So I'll have a negative out front, a 2x, and x, a minus 3, a plus 1, and an absolute value of 3 minus x. This right here, I already told you, is either going to be 1 or negative 1. I would reason it out honestly by being a creeper. So I'm going to go like this. I would have negative from this, 2 times 3, which is 6, plus 1. That's going to contribute negative 7. The rest of that is going to be 1 over 1. Those are opposites, right? 1's an absolute value, so I have to check whether this is going to be a positive or a negative 1. I think the safest way is to just be a creeper. You could use the definition, but I just go to the right, maybe to 4, correct? And see what happens. On the top, I'd have 4 minus 3, which is positive 1. On the bottom, I'd have 3 minus 4, which is negative 1. But it's an absolute value, so I'm at positive 1 again. The answer to this is negative 7. Now, had this said from the left, okay, then I'd go to the left of 3. Sometimes you, you might want to think of 2.9, because I always say get close. But for these, you don't have to get super close because of how consistent this graph is. It's, it's a horizontal line to the left and to the right. So it doesn't particularly matter. But you'll notice on the top, I'd get a negative 0.01 with this, on the bottom I get the absolute value of, 2 .0, of 0.01, which is 0.01. These would yield a negative one, in which case I'd change that. So the moral of the story for the absolute values is, the absolute value of stuff over the same stuff always equals one or negative one. If you're doing a one-sided approach, that's what your answer will be. It'll either be one, or negative one. The minute I take that off, I know it's a D and E, because we split at that, um, at whatever makes that expression equal to zero. So last up, just some quick properties of limits. They're fairly self-explanatory. When they get harder, we spend a full day um, doing what's called non-traditional limits. But for today, today we're going to keep these properties pretty light, and we're just going to assume that this hypothesis is always met, meaning that there actually is a limit to f. It actually exists, and the limit of g also actually exists. When one or both of those don't exist, 
we can't use these properties and we have to take another approach, but that's for another day. So you can split the limit up for addition. So if F is going to L and G is going to M, we can just say this is L plus M. And that's sort of the theory behind all of these. They're pretty self-explanatory. You could split the subtraction up into two separate limits and then just subtract them separately. You could split these up into two separate limits and then just divide them, provided G of X can't be zero again. We can't divide by zero, so there's a little caveat on that one. Same here, you would just say this is the limit as x approaches a of f of x times limit x approaches a of g of x. So consequently, you can just multiply the two. Constants, when you're doing limits, this c stands for constant, which means it's a 5 or a pi or an 8. They can come out front. And actually, for all of our calculus, limits, derivatives, and integrals, that rule holds for all of them. Constants can come out front of the operation. You might say, what does that mean? Well, instead of saying limit of 5 times f of x as x approaches, let's say, c, I could actually just take the limit as x approaches c of f of x and multiply it by 5, either one. They're equivalent. When we're doing powers, we can again, oh, so this would be C times L using that notation above. We can take the limit, do it first, and then raise it to the power. So if the limit of all this stuff is L, I can actually just do L to the P. And these will clear up when we go do some examples. The limit of any constant is actually important. Remember in here, this is the function y or f of x equals c. If I said what does y equal 2 make or what does f of x equal 5 make, those are functions of the form y equals c. Hopefully you tell me a horizontal line up at 2, LaRue. Yes. Or for this one right here, hopefully you'd say horizontal line up at 5. And I'd say yes. When I come in to any number from both directions, what's my y value? Well, I'm up at 5. How about on this one, when I come in at, say, 3 from both directions? Well, I'm up at 2 because my y value is constant up there. My limits are y values. So the limit of any constant as I approach anything is always that constant. With all the variables, it kind of gets jumbled. So let's go show what I mean. Let's throw my favorite number 10 in here. What that means right here is my answer's 10. But again, a graphical interpretation of that is helpful. The function y equals 10 is a horizontal line up at 10. I will be approaching 5 on the function from both directions. What is my y value? 10. That's what this means. So anytime we take the limit of a constant, we get that constant. We'll go practice this a little bit graphically. I'm not going to do all of these. So really what this is saying is as long as these limits exist, let's go check. As I approach 2 from the left on f, I'm up at 3. As I approach 2 from the left on g, where's 2 here, I'm at 1. So I can just add them separately for a 4. That's really all that's saying. So I'll we'll just do a couple of these. And again, if the limit does not exist there, it's a little bit of a different issue, but we're just going to keep it straightforward today. So technically, if I were writing this out, I'd say, well, that's a constant. I'm allowed to pull it out front of f. The 3 is a constant. I'm allowed to pull it out front. The subtraction property says I can split them up. I'll go read the graph. I'm going to approach negative 1 from both directions on f down at negative 6. So I'd have 2 times negative 6 minus 3 times. Then I'll go over to my graph of g. And what am I approaching? Negative 1 again from both directions. And it looks like I am down at, it's hard to read this graph when I'm so close to it. I'm down at negative 1, it looks like. 
so I'd have negative 12 plus 3, and you can do the math. So let's find one with a power in it. Here we go. The power rule says you can actually just take the limit as x approaches negative 2 of the function, two-sided approach, and then square the entire answer. So let's hop on f. Let's approach negative 2 from both directions. So coming in from the left, coming in from the right, I'm at negative 5 on the y-axis. Remember, limits are y values. And then I can just square that, and my answer is 25. So these properties are really easy to use. Let's do the last one. So I can consider this the limit as x approaches 2 just from one side of twice g of x. I can bring the 2 out if I want to. I can do that. That's legal. But then I can raise the whole thing to the 1 half power. So I'm going to raise the whole thing to the 1 half power. So those powers can go on outside of the limit. So let's go take the limit as x approaches 2 from the right. Let's double it. So am I on g or f? I'm on g. I'm going to approach 2 from the right. I will be up at 6. So that was kind of the L in the other problem. So this is 6. I will double it for 12. And then I'm to raise it to the 1 half power, which is the square root of 12, root 4, root 3, or 2, root 3. So that's it. I wanted to keep them under 30 minutes, and I'm at 31. So sorry. But you'll want to show these to me tomorrow. And then we'll go to the library. And those of you who have these done will work on the worksheet. Those of you who don't will need to watch the notes first. So your ticket to the worksheet is to show me completed notes. But actually, to make sure you're, yeah, we'll do it tomorrow. You, somebody remind me who's still listening that I told you I was going to tell you which ones to star. And that's really important. So somebody remind me. Say, Rude, you got to tell us which ones to star. Remember, star equals for sure on the test. It doesn't mean that's all that's on the test, but I, I am telling you um, a similar one. I'm going to tell you I'm not going to star anything on this page because it's just it's pretty easy. Um, and the ones that aren't, we're going to do on their own day. So have a good one, guys. Ciao for now.